honored to be introducing Mr. Gaurav Dalmia. Mr. Dalmia is indeed one of the most reputed and foremost value investors in India, and often referred to as India's Warren Buffett in our popular culture. He is the chairman of Dalmia Group Holdings, a holding company for business and financial assets, which invests in private equity, real estate, public markets, structured debt, and fixed income. He's a rare example of a successful journalist. He's an early stage investor and a board member of True North, a leading private equity fund which manages approximately 3.5 billion US dollars. He is also the founder and chairman of Landmark Holdings, a real estate investment firm which has invested in more than 40 housing projects. He co-founded GTI, a long-term investment vehicle for India-focused investments. He is a board member of Brookings India. He was selected as Global Leader for Tomorrow by World Economic Forum 2000. We are proud to claim that Mr. Dalmia is a Columbia Business School alum who graduated with the prestigious Beta Gamma Sigma Honors. Without further ado, I now invite Mr. Dalmia to deliver his keynote address. Thank you, Uma. Well, I'm trying to be Warren Buffett. We try to think long term. We try not to be dissuaded by what Mr. Buffett calls Mr. Market. It hasn't quite worked yet for me. So a friend suggested I should have a lot more cherry coke. That might help. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you about India. And it's apt that I'm speaking at uh, Columbia University, which is a renowned liberal arts. Uh, institution. And I would like to look at India from various lenses. A lens of history, economics, psychology, philosophy, politics, even literature. And I will share some of my own views uh, as we go along. Now, before we go get there, Joan Robinson was a British economist who said, whatever you can rightly say about India, the opposite is also true. And what she meant was that India is so diverse and so large that what happens in one part of India is very different from what happens in another part of India. So you may hear contradictory stories about India, and they're all true. So if you look at the eastern state of Bihar, the per capita GDP of Bihar is, let's say, X. The per capita GDP of Haryana is 4X. And the per capita GDP of Goa is 8x. So when local politicians from Bihar and Goa talk to each, about, each other about challenges, they can never reach a consensus. And that's a challenge for a big and diverse com uh, country like India. And I want you to keep that in mind when you hear conflicting stories, whether it's from marketing companies or private equity or from the stock market or from banks. Now, let me look at India first from the lens of history. American inventor Charles Kettering said something which I think applies to India. It's easy to build a philosophy. It doesn't have to run. So when India got independent, India emulated the consensus view of that time, which was left-leaning. Okay. We tried every trick in the trade, and we found it wasn't working. Only in the 90s, we changed course dramatically. Okay. So that's one of the lessons of history that I think this Indian generation of leaders has internalized that we are not going back to the policies of the 50s and the 60s. We're going to stay with the policies of the 90s with minor trinkling here and there. Just look at where India was when it was born. People said that the size and diversity of India would make it ungovernable. In other countries of similar size, you've had military interventions. In India, you haven't, which I think is a big plus. We just take it for granted. People said we may get swept by the wave of communism and authoritarian regimes, which was shaking Asia at that time. It didn't happen in India. There was a risk of poverty trap. 70% of the people were under the uh, uh, poverty line. There was a risk of Western dependency. The poverty rate has reduced to 22%. And India has turned into a net aid provider now, which is a very proud moment for our country. Savings rate was 10%, GDP growth was 3.5%. Savings rate at its peak went up to 32%, it's now at about 30. 
GDP growth rate is about 7%. So we've come a long way since the risks of our birth. Now, if you look at a historic trend of India's share of GDP, India's share of GDP was more than 30%. And it fell during the Industrial Revolution. And it's come back up to about 8%. China's had an even more remarkable turnaround in terms of world GDP share. And I think India is catching up. So that's another perspective to keep in mind. Now let's look at India from the lens of economics. Classical economic theory will tell you that economic growth is investment rate divided by incremental capital output ratio. Our investment rate is about 30%, which is a function of savings rate, which itself is a function of culture. It's a very sticky thing. Indians are by nature savers. And it is also a function of dependency ratio. So if you go back into the 60s, our savings rate was 15% because our dependency ratios were higher. As we've come to the current decade, our dependency ratio has reduced and our savings rate has gone up. So India's natural fighting weight is somewhere in the range of seven, seven and a half percent. It's fashionable in India to talk about we will do nine percent growth. While I like that idea, I don't know whether it is really a case that can be underwritten. It's a possibility. It'll happen for short periods of time. But I think a long-term fighting weight is in the range of 7.5%, and I won't be disappointed if we keep just at that number and don't go particularly higher. If you don't believe India's government data, because there are errors, there are lags, you can follow the Li Kuang Index, uh, start, uh, advocated by the Chinese vice premier. And he said, you know, government data has problems. Why not look at changes in electricity consumption, cargo movement, and lo loan disbursements? And you can get a proxy for the economy and economic growth. So if you look at that, I have data for one year ago. It was 6.4%, 6 right, which correlated to actual GDP data from that time. On my own, I tend to look at these kind of variables in addition to the government data on economic growth, and I would encourage you to do the same. One of the big things spoken about in India is the black economy. It's considered to be in the range of 20% of GDP. We had a demonetization event a year and a half ago. Since then, the good news is, we all know the bad news, the good news is direct tax collection has gone up 18%. Corporate tax collection has gone up by 10%. Personal tax has gone up by 26, uh, 21%. And this has happened in an era of real economic growth of 6.5% and a nominal economic growth of about 10, 10 and a half percent. Okay. So I think the verdict of demonetization is still out there. We will see how it changes behavior, and I think it will actually change behavior for the better. Another topic of hot debate in India is the state of the banks, okay, and the problems of the banking sector. So if you look at 2016, and you look at the capital needs of small and medium enterprises, it was about 529 billion which was funded by informal sources to the tune of 350 billion, the friends and family program, as they call it. And from formal sources to the tune of 179 billion, of which banks were 116 billion. This 116 billion is at risk whether the banks will continue to provide this level of financing in the years to come. Okay. So the projection is, by 2020, the small and medium enterprises will need 994 billion, and a lot of this will be provided by the non-bank finance sector rather than by the banks. And in this problem, there's an opportunity for the NBFCs. And you can see NBFCs growing their book at more than 30%, earning returns, of, uh, returns on equity of more than 20%. And when you compound a 20% return on equity with a 30% growth, over long periods of time, NBFCs have been huge wealth creators taking market share away from banks. Example, there's a well-known NBFC called Edelweiss. If you invested in this in March 13, five years later, 
you would have been a 5x. Okay. I think all NBFCs are levered plays on the Indian economy. Uh, Edelweiss is a prime example. We were investors in this company. I think there's one bet that will stay with us about India, no matter what, is what I would call the operating leverage of the Indian middle class. So think about an Indian middle class person earning $100 in salary. $80 of this $100 goes in what we will call in Hindi roti kapra or makan, which is your day-to-day -day expenses. And you have $20 of disposable income. Wage growth in India is about 10%. Okay. So let's assume he goes from 100 to 110, take out inflation of about five, so his real wage growth is five, right? So he goes from 100 to 105 in real terms. His disposable income just went up by 25%. So you have millions of Indians crossing the threshold where they may have 10% wage growth, but 20, 30, 40% disposable income growth. So you have mature industries, automotive, right? Mature in the West, fast growing in India. Airline travel, 22% growth over the last four years, okay? Fast growing in India. You have insurance penetration going at a fast pace. All this is because of the operating leverage of the Indian consumer. So when you think about wealth creation in India, a lot of the old economy companies actually do very well riding just this one ticket. Look at Maruti Suzuki, how it's done. Now let's look at India from a lens of psychology. Now one of the issues is, how are the elite thinking? As per the global financial integrity research, illicit outflows from India were $165 billion four years ago. So the elite are thinking very differently from foreign investors. They are foreign investors coming in you have the Indian elite pulling out money out of India. Now, this I can't reconcile in my mind. I would bet all my capital in India. Now, let's look at the psychology of India's youth. You know, people talk about convergence, and you can actually see convergence with global youth. So what does the Indian youth want? They want good brands. They actually prefer local brands. So the Levi's of the world are not going to take over India in a hurry. You will have local competition, which will have local appeal. They're very quality and cost conscious. They're concerned about the environment. They're impatient like youth anywhere else in the world. And we're going to resemble other countries, whether it's a Singapore or a Brazil, in terms of how our trends on consumer markets shape up. Let's look at India from a lens of philosophy. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, and this is during his good days, not from the last couple of weeks, <laughs> said, optimists tend to be successful, but the pessimists tend to be right. You know? Now, let's look at what people have done in the turbulence of India with optimism and confidence. So you look at Paytm, one of the great success stories of India. is doing four billion transactions a year now, valued at about $7 billion. There was a gold rush. N number of people were playing in the marketplace. It wasn't clear on day one who would win, right? There were skeptics. There was criticism. There was capital available at the same time. A company like Paytm navigated its way and he's built a great business. So it's the same Mark Zuckerberg view. The optimists tend to be successful, and the pessimists tend to be right. People are saying there'll be problems in AT uh, Paytm, there'll be problems here, and there will be, and the challenge is to overcome those. Let's look at India from the lens of politics. I think the good news about India, and I'm speaking in America, so it's a little bit more applicable right now. First of all, when I meet Americans right now, they apologize for Donald Trump. So, if you look at the breadth of political opinion in Europe, let's assume it's that broad. If you look at the 
breadth of political in, uh, opinion in the US, it's narrower than in Europe, even after the recent polarization that you've seen over the last couple of years. If you look at the breadth of political opinion in India, it's even narrower. So the whole concept of political risk, which way are we headed, is almost irrelevant from which party wins the next general election. I think it makes for good entertainment, it makes for good cocktail conversation, but from an economic and social standpoint, the differences are less than what we think. And I think, therefore, we should not worry about where India is headed politically. It's fairly centric. Some things will be right of center, some things will be left of center. Nothing dramatic will happen, I think. That's the bet. India will remain what, in foreign policy parlance, is called a status quo power. We're not going to try and project our power into Africa or here or there. Right. We will be inward looking, we will manage our economy, we will not divert resources. You can argue that's not so good, right? but India's setup is such that we can't really project power and waste money in other countries. Oh, I was having lunch with a BJP minister a couple of uh, months ago, and he told me something very interesting. He said, Gaurav, the business community's problem is you think of Mr. Modi as an economic reformer, but he mm -hmm. thinks of himself as a social reformer, and economic reform is only a small subset of what he's achieving, uh, trying to achieve. When I started looking at government actions with this new view, a lot of it was automatically explained. Okay. I would encourage you to think of India in terms of social reform and the changes that are happening, than only the narrow economic reform You know, India is often called a bungling democracy, which it is. And uh, my wife asked me to put this slide. So if you don't understand why democracy is so slow and an inefficient way to run things, try to get your family of four with teenage children to agree where to go for lunch. So when you have people in Goa thinking differently, when you have people in Bihar thinking very differently, when you have people in Haryana thinking very differently, this teenage family of India finds it very difficult to figure out where to go for lunch, what should the priorities be, and there'll be endless debate. Amartya Sen's great book, The Argumentative Indian, points to the same thing. Now, one should distinguish between input democracy and output democracy. So India is input democracy. We can all go and vote. The common man can vent his feelings. We can protest. There will be no crackdowns on these protests. So input democracy works very well. Output democracy is where we have challenges. So if you're a lower caste person and your cow gets stolen and you show up at the police station saying, my cow got stolen, you don't get treated right. If you're an upper caste person, you have a similar problem, you will get treated better, right? So the output of this democratic process is not evenly distributed, it has its own biases and that's changing, I think. Now, if you look at it, where does it show itself today? You have falling turnout in elections, which is sad, because many people feel alienated. Right? People need to be rallied to go and vote. You have tax evasion because people believe that the government is not doing enough with the tax dollars, or not doing good things with the tax dollars. You have social biases. You have interest groups which try to protect one industry or uh, uh, one kind of community. You have political rent-seeking, which used to be very common, and that's reduced dramatically. And you have feeble state capacity. If you look at the Naxalite problems in large portions of India, right, it's outside the control of the administration. This is the, these are manifestations of output democracy uh, uh, being challenged. Let's look at India from the lens of sociology. So I would encourage everyone to read this book by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru called The Discovery of India. It was written when he was in prison. He used to handwrite it, send it to his daughter Indira Gandhi, who used to have it transcribed, and it ultimately became a book. It speaks about the British days. It speaks about India's social uh, challenges. And many of those social challenges are there even today. And he predicts how they will evolve. And those predictions are actually turning out to be correct after 80 or 90 years. Now, movies, I think, are a leading indicator 
of significant social change. So if you look at the 50s and 60s, the movies, the big hits, were about social issues, thirst for change. As you got into the 1780s, and 80s, people were disappointed. And the angry young man, Amitabh Bachchan, rose to make the best movies. Right? And these were people who were anti-establishment. If you came into the 90s, the big theme in the best movies was urbanization, the expatriate Indian community, and the prosperity that was being seen in urban India. If you look at current big hits, we challenge everything. We challenge God, right? If you've seen the movie PK, you challenge social norms, and so on and so forth. So I think India has evolved, if you look at it from the lens of movies, quite a bit, okay? It's gone up, gone down, and it's back up. If you look at India from a lens of public policy, I think it's fairly interesting. Some people will argue that the most important thing in an economy are the institutions. If you can manage your institutions well, your systems will do well. So let's look at India's institutions. First of all, India's institutions are forced to cater to a range of conflicting demands because of India's diversity. So the institutions themselves are a little overwhelmed. Two, India's regulators often play catch up with market realities. We've seen this in the coal auctions, we've seen this with telecom, we see it all the time. We see it with the banking regulator, we see it all the time. In defining moments, India's story is of individual heroism and not institutional initiatives. So we have key man risk. You may have a very good governor of the Reserve Bank, you may have a very good police officer, you may have a very good prime minister, and those things define the India story more than the Reserve Bank of India, or the cabinet, or the police force in general. The other thing I see is most of the big initiatives of the government have a crisis as a frame of reference, leading to an overreaction. So if you look at the current bankruptcy code, we're in a real crisis. When you're in a real crisis, all of us are tempted to overreact, and so does the government of India. Okay. These are to be expected because that's the state of our institutions, that's the state of our economics, that's the state of our polity, and it's not about to change in a hurry. I would still rank India's institutions in the top quartile, maybe not in the top decile, which is a great place to be. You know, we were having dinner the other day, and one of, uh, there was a Japanese a friend of mine, he said, well, you guys criticize so many different things. Can you imagine being one of the Indonesian institutions, which are much worse? So you should be happy with what you have. Let's look at India from a lens of globalization. So, in 2016, India had $65 billion of inward remittances, almost 4% of GDP. So we are more globalized just by that one factor than the other trade numbers that you would see. Okay. When oil goes up, Kerala booms. Oil falls, Kerala doesn't do that well. Let's look at another metric. We had a shale oil boom in the US several years ago. Guar gum is an additive used in shale oil extraction. There was a guar gum boom in Jodhpur. So I met this businessman from Jodhpur. His cash in the bank, he had a family office, cash in the bank was I think $200 million. One product, guar gum. Four year boom, he amasses $200 million. Now, surprise. Apologies to Cognizant. India has seven billionaires from information technology. India has 10 billionaires from auto and auto parts. Before I saw this statistic, I would have actually guessed the other way around. So old economy has actually done very well in India. People tend to underestimate the power of the old economy in a developing country like India. Look at Infosys, how well it's done. It's a well-known story. Here's a company we invested in. We made about 5x our investment. Small company called Sandhar, auto parts company. So we call it baby Infosys. Now, 
Let me take another view. Why does Henry Kravis like India? He's a sophisticated investor. Since 2009, KKR has invested over $8 billion in India. Henry Kravis comes to India two or three times a year. Private equity has, as a whole has invested $130 billion since 2009. In dollar terms, people are making 15 to 17% IRR in private equity in median returns, which is pretty good. And I think that speaks about the India opportunity. Private equity, Henry Kravis, Blackstone, Warwick Pincus, you name it. Let's look at India from a lens of management. In the old days, when I was young and naive, I'm now old and naive, but when I was young and naive, I used to think that assets are important, legacy assets, market share, distribution network, physical assets are important. We found after our investing experience that teams are much more important. So, for example, look at the cement business. Shri Cement is valued at about $325 per ton, whereas your median cement company is valued in the range of $175 to $200 per ton of capacity. Because people believe Shri Cement can do better with their assets, right? The return on equity is better. Their ability to put up new projects is faster, therefore their growth is better, and so on and so forth. So what differentiates companies is not quality of assets, it's quality of management. Okay? And if this is true in a capital-intensive cement business, imagine how true it may be in a software services business, how true it may be in a consumer business. Thinking about quality of management, look at Berger Paints. If you had invested in it 10 years ago, you would have been up almost 20 times. Okay. Simple business, it's a paint business, much higher margins than what you see in the US, okay. growing rapidly, one of the top wealth creators in India over the last 20 years in terms of compounding of wealth. Let's look at India from a lens of finance. Now, most people, when they look at India, they use the Nifty as the benchmark. May I submit to you that the Nifty is not the right benchmark. The National Stock Exchange has another index. It's called the Nifty Quality Index. The difference is Nifty is a sample of what's happening in the Indian economy and listed companies as a whole. It ha it'll have a coal company, mining company, is this, that, and the other. The Nifty Quality Index resembles what people like us invest in more, high return on equity businesses, faster growth businesses. And there's almost a 3% annualized return difference between Nifty and Nifty Quality Index. So if I only beat the Nifty in my investments, I've not done very well. I could have just bought the Nifty Quality Index and gone to sleep. So our target is actually to beat the Nifty Quality Index by two to 300 basis points. Now this is a complicated slide. Let's look at upside. So if you look at France, Germany, and some of the other developed markets, your profit margins are near the historic peaks. Okay. If you look at emerging markets, your profit margins are below the historical average. So one of the arguments made about India is our profit as a percentage of sales, our return on equity numbers, are subdued because of business cycles. So if things normalize, you may have big earning bumps in India. Depending on which sell-side research you're reading, you will hear earnings growth stories being projected from for the nifty companies as a whole, from 17% to 20%, depending on which one you're hearing. So I think there is a lot of earnings growth story that will play out in different sectors in the next four to five years. And that will be, I think, a positive surprise. Now, if you look at what sectors are favored in India, consumer is favored. We find consumer to be very expensive, so we tend to invest in consumer proxies, consumer-related logistics and transportation, niche consumer businesses, and so on and so forth. Financials have been a huge wealth creator in India, whether it's banks or NBFCs, we tend to play in that area. Information technology 
has been a huge wealth creator. We've tended to play in some of the niche companies in that sector. We tend not to play in pharmaceutical and healthcare, which has also been a great wealth creator in India, simply because it's outside a circle of competence. But I think these four sectors have pro provided disproportionate returns in India. Things that I think people should worry about. Infrastructure, it's a very sexy word in India. Unfortunately, it's low return on capital employed. There are regulatory challenges. We tend to stay away from most of that. We flirted with a few things. It hasn't turned out as expected. Consumer internet. We like industries where the hierarchies are not set. So we should have liked consumer internet. But again, it falls outside our circle of competence. Even though as a consumer, I think it will change my life. So Bill Gates says, we always underestimate change in the long term. But we overestimate that same change in the short term. Okay. So I think it will change the lives of many people. I just don't understand how to invest in it. If Flipkart gets acquired by Walmart, as the current news is, I think investors are going to do very, very well. And a lot of last man standing type of consumer internet companies will find that the valuation just went up because of that one deal. Let's look at India from a lens of marketing. I believe India will create 100 brands of $100 million or more of revenue in the next 10 years. Okay. I think niche brands are doing remarkably well. You can see that brand called Patanjali you've probably heard of in the fast-moving consumer goods space. A company called uh, Vinnie Cosmetics, which makes the fog uh, deodorant. Paper Boat in juices and beverages. Fab Indian Apparel. Indigo in airlines. And you, the story goes on and on and on. BCG is considered one of the great daddies of consumer research and uh, marketing worldwide. And they think consumption expenditure will increase to $4 trillion by 2025. Here's a company you should have invested in six years ago. If you had invested in Vinnie Cosmetics, which makes the Fog deodorant brand, you would have made 21 times your money in six years. Forget valuation. Here is a company which makes $20 million plus in EBITDA within six years of its operation. Now, that to me is an astounding story. Let me look at India from a lens of risk. We've spoken about the bankruptcy problems. I think deficits will continue to be a problem. Rupee strength, I think, is an anomaly. It will not sustain. Historic trends of rupee uh, uh, correcting will come into play sooner or later as oil goes up and so on and so forth. Here's a company which I, as a customer of this company, am very happy. But look at Bharti Airtel. It's not created wealth in the last 10 years. It's been a zigzag. Now, here's a strong company I would have really believed in, right? Regulatory changes, market changes, and before, before the onslaught of geo. Now, let me quickly go into a Dalmia view of how we approach the world. Our objective is capital growth rather than wealth preservation. We are a top quartile risk taker. We focus on capital gains rather than current income. And we prefer returns over liquidity. And our investment horizon, we can go up to 10 years. We think a top-down view is quite seductive and therefore even misleading. I think the action and the differentiation lies in a bottoms-up view. Okay. Over a 10-year cycle, macro matters for only 20% of the time. Okay. It's the micro story which you need to bet on and underwrite. Return hurdles. We think the return should be GDP growth, let's say 7, 7.5%, plus inflation, let's say 4%, plus 300 basis points. So it triangulates to somewhere around 14, 15%. If we don't achieve that, right, we are very disappointed. Look at the passive investment benchmark. If you just invested in the Sensex, you got 11% plus 3% dividend yield. Right? So you got 14% for doing nothing. So that also triangulates into what we want to beat. So one interesting point I want to make is I am maximum bullish on India. 
there's growth everywhere. But because there is growth everywhere, I think you don't need to do heavy lifting. You can do basic Warren Buffett style investing and make a lot of money. You don't have to do high jumps, as he says. We divide our world into five, private equity, real estate, public markets, structured debt, and short-term investments. And we tend to play more for the long term. We are relative value seekers, so we'll move from one asset class to the other, depending where we see value, rightly or wrongly. And that's served as well. Now, if you just look at the Forbes billionaires list, right? Investments has created the largest number of billionaires, 267. Fashion and retail has created 221 billionaires. Technology has created 159, and real estate has created 163. The Asian story is somewhat different. Real estate has created disproportionate share of billionaires in Asia, this is not India. Manufacturing, as I was pointing out, automotive versus IT, has created great wealth in Asia. Diversified companies and technology companies have done well as well. So we try and see what the empirical evidence is. One of our great learnings is when the stock and the bond markets disagree, the bond markets are normally right. The stock markets have a lot of emotion built into them. Right? You're always thinking about how you will make future profits. The bond markets don't give a damn about profits. They just want their money back with some return. Right? So we tend to focus on accounting numbers, not just the growth numbers. You have to ride volatility. India's illiquid market, and from time to time, Mr. Market behaves badly, and you have to ride volatility, more so in India than in most of the markets. Lessons from the masters, be happy to sit idle for long periods of time. Right. We do that happily. Be independent-minded, don't follow the crowd. We are learning how to do that. And you, when you make investments, make large concentrated bets. Diversification, as Warren Buffett says, is a hedge against your own ignorance. So we tend not to be over-diversified. Amy Chua teaches at Yale, and she talks about what makes immigrants in the US tick. Guess what? The same things that makes you tick in the US makes the good people, the smart people, tick in India. She points out three things. Immigrants have a superiority complex. They know they are smart. Yet, they're insecure because they know they have to prove themselves. And they have impulse control, which means they think and play for the long term rather than current consumption. When we look at fund managers, when we look at entrepreneurs whom we back, we look for these same things. Would you make a good immigrant? If you would make a good immigrant, you'll make a good entrepreneur in India. We tend to do repeat business. So, for example, we invested with a company called ATS. We've done numerous transactions with them over the last seven years, and we continue to do repeat business with entrepreneurs we like. We like simple stories. We invested in HDFC Bank. If you had invested in HDFC Bank when it IPO'd in 96, you would have made 600 times your money. Okay. Its value is almost 90% that of Goldman Sachs, which is 149 years old. So look at the growth potential of India. RBL Bank, again, a great story. We did not invest in it, and we often follow companies that we don't invest in, but we come close to investing in. Okay. Great story. Our family business is Dalmia Cement. In the last seven years, it's done 16x on its market cap. It's valued at $4.5 billion now. Bajaj Finance. If you had invested in 08, you would have made 55x. These are just examples from our portfolio of investments as to what you can achieve in India. A company called Avanti Feeds, you have made more than 500x if you had invested in this little shrimp feed business in 2010. These, this is, these are the amazing stories. You couldn't have invested too much money in this company because it was a $20 million market cap company in 2010. One interesting point I want to make. So if you look at the x-axis, okay, it talks about the composite index. And if you look at the y-axis, uh, it talks about the change. So the Indian economy was recovering 
and then it went down, and it's recovering again. So the economic indicators are good, and they are changing for the better. Okay. So we're clearly on a path of recovery. I follow this chart every quarter, how it's shaping up. Let me now come to the lens of literature before I end, because I think there's something very interesting. There's a British economist called Sir Alec Kane Cross, and he said, a trend is a trend is a trend, but the question is, will it bend? This is a poem. Will it alter its course, and the next line is most important, through some unforeseen force and come to a premature end? So this is what I worry about, various things in India. The trends are great, but something unforeseen can happen and change the trend. Lastly, I will quote the great Marilyn Monroe. India, Marilyn Monroe, India makes mistakes. Marilyn Monroe, India is out of control at times and is hard to handle. But if you can't handle India at its worst, you sure as hell don't deserve Marilyn Monroe or India at its best. Thank you. We're open for questions, so if you have any questions, please feel free to come up to both the mics in the audience, um, and we'll go from there. Uh, my name is Bharat Ramani. I wanted to uh, talk about the startup ecosystem and what are your views on that, and when will India come up with products like, you know, China is coming up with their own set of products against Facebook and uh, uh, Amazon and Google. So what do you feel about the startup ecosystem in India, and when will India come up with some excellent products which are world stage? You know, I'm not a technology startup on, uh, investor, so I can give you a very kind of uh, distant uh, view. You know, if you look at uh, Indian companies in the consumer internet businesses, some of them have done very well, whether, in, whether it's in the travel domain or whether it's in food services and so on. So, so I think niche products, India has done very, very well. Whether these companies will become truly global and come and conquer America, go and, go and come and conquer the West, I wouldn't know. But I think uh, it's happening. Yeah, I have a question here. So I'm a first year uh, student at the business school. I see a lot of optimism in your speech. Thank you for a great introduction. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what worries you most about India? Is it like jobs, a dysfunctional parliament? Is there a single worry which uh, worries you the most? I think the single biggest worry for me as an Indian is job creation. So as a rule of thumb, India needs to create a million jobs a month. And our net job creation is half a million or some dismally low number for the whole year. So where are these people going? The 12 million people who need to be employed, they're going into the lower end of the services industry. They're self-employed doing random low-end service jobs. That's not a good sign of prosperity for India as a society. Okay. So to me, that can create a lot of social dysfunction if this, if this kind of trend persists over 20 years. So to me, that's the single largest uh, factor for a citizen, government, businessman to focus on. Hi, Mr. Gaurav Dalmia. Uh, I have a question on the real estate sector. Now, uh, from my past experiences, I've seen that real estate transactions depend heavily on cash, especially in cities like Delhi and Mumbai. Do you think this is a big hindrance for private equity or formalization, and how can we overcome this? You know, I'm not sure whether cash is a big portion of real estate transactions. So if you look at divide, segment the market into high-end, mid-end, and so on and so forth, I think the high-end market is where cash transactions happen, and they are badly hurt. Okay. The mid-end market does not have cash transactions. It's mortgage-financed. So if you look at the growth, it's all happening in the mid-end and the lower mid-end and affordable, as they call it. And as private equity, we tend to focus only on those segments. We tend not to do luxury, because firstly, demand is very volatile in luxury. And secondly, you have this whole problem of cash, no cash, and so on and so forth. And as private equity, you can't deal with cash type of transactions. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dalmia, for your speech. I really enjoyed your keynote. Uh, so I had a question on the institutions that you spoke about. So one of the institutions that all of us had real trust in was the judiciary. Uh, and one thing that worries me in the past few months is the news that's coming in 
Uh, some scams that we thought were very huge, uh, you know, came off full clean, uh, and there are a few battles within the Supreme Court. So, does this worry you? And what's your opinion on this? You know, I think most of the institutions in India are some way compromised, judiciary uh, included. But I'm optimistic that these problems are transient and they will solve themselves. I think it's noise more than news. Hello, Mr. Dalmia. Thank you for this insightful talk. I really enjoyed it. I have a quick question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, these recent Trump administration, you know, blocking some of the trades that are happening with China? Uh, it's, it's in billions. Uh, you know more than that, more than I do. I was wondering what kind of opportunities it opens up for Indian manufacturing sec sector especially and for other exports from India coming to U.S. and are there investment opportunities, immediate long-term opportunities that you foresee? Thank you. You know, I have two comments. I won't, won't really have a comment on where U.S. and China are headed vis-a-vis -vis the so-called trade war. But I think the world is becoming more protectionist as a whole. So if you look at the last five years, the pendulum keeps swinging. So it's swinging towards protectionism. The US-China story is a subset of that story. In India, as a businessman, we lobby to the government. Please try and be a part of as many uh, bilateral free trade agreements as you can. Because in a protectionist world, the bilaterals bring a lot of value to Indian businesses. And India traditionally has not been a part of enough bilateral treaties. So I think that's the opportunity for India to do and therefore for Indian businesses to grow globally. Thank you. Thank you. That will be our last question for this session. Thank you.